I can promise you guys, if you are a university student here at Texas State, and you want to get to know Christ better, you have no option. You have to study. I've got to read. I've got to study. Why? Because in order to love someone more, you've got to get to know them better. And if I'm going to love Jesus more, if I'm going to love God more, i got to get to know him better. And the only way that's going to happen is by studying, by working. You see, this whole attitude in our culture, well, Jesus is just going to overwhelm me. It's just going to happen, guys. It's false. It's not just going to happen. You've got to open up yourself. What does that mean? i got to die to my egotism, my arrogance, my getting angry and wanting to basically cut people off at the knees for the way they cut me off at the knees. Well, Ma'am, I can promise you that is hard. You're skeptics, which is good. You can't believe anybody, everybody. People will eat your lunch if you believe everybody. So I went to a Christian school, so yeah. I like studied it, but then I obviously left because I felt like, I don't know. I, I saw more um, nihilistic points of views that were more valuable than just Christianity. But I, I do, I do see, I do see some fundamentals of uh, Christianity being correct. But there are some that I just don't really follow. Like, All right, please tell me what's the value of nihilism? Like uh, just the belief of nothing. Like at the end, there's pretty much nothing. Like it's it's everlasting, either death or everlasting life. And it, if it's everlasting, it's not really in existence. I mean, it's, well, so what's the value of that? It's nothing. I mean, it's like it's like, what's the value of God? Like he was here before, he's here after. He's the Omega, he's the Alpha. But like yeah. at the end, there's not really a point. I mean, you're. Oh yes, there is, sir. But I mean, it's if like God created you. It means there's a purpose to your life. If there is no God and nihilism is true, it means life is meaningless. No, no, no. no I'm not saying nihilism is true. I'm saying nihilism is a perspective. It's your, it's well, God. sure, it's, it's a perspective. It's, it's, no, Look, I mean, I mean, think I'm, about it. Albert Camus pointed out, if there is no God, the only question you must answer is, why not commit suicide? Because life is ultimately a crapshoot. It's yeah. ultimately meaningless. Well, that's nihilism. Um, yeah. so, All right? So I think a, a really big portion you're missing out here is that you can impose meaning onto your life. There aren't inherent value systems that, that are brought forth upon humanity like once they, once they start to exist. There's like a post-nihilistic... Um, avenue for people that think that they want to have a positive life and they can affirm their life. Good. Have, have a positive meaning. life. Good yeah. luck. Yeah, but I, I but just to be honest with yourself intellectually and realize the positive life that I have today based on whatever I choose, if I do the opposite tomorrow, that's just as legitimate. Yeah, but which I, means it's all meaningless. Well, just remember with your positive attitude that Mother Teresa and Adolf Hitler are in the same place right now. The fertilizer pit which means it really doesn't matter whether you're Adolf Hitler II or Mother Teresa II. It's all meaningless. So try and live that out. You can't. I don't think you can. But I think Instead, you no, will no, choose no. to no. continuously give your life meaning. Okay, but don't do that if you're gonna if you're gonna believe that nihilism is true. Be intellectually consistent. Well, the right? reason the reason why I, I, I'm not saying nihil, nihilism is true because obviously there like if you if, if you're religious there's some. I mean it, it's all it's all perspective. It's like if. if if I have everlasting life yes. and I'm always happy, I'm not gonna like. It's like if I hit a lottery, like one day, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna feel great. If yeah. I hit the same lottery the next day, I'm right. gonna be like, alright, that was that was pretty f-ing dope. If I hit it like a hundred times in a row, it's not it's not it's not a value. It's just a custom. So if I'm living forever, it's just the custom. It's not really living. That's what nihilism, the nihilistic points of views are. It's not really it's not really saying. There is no heaven or hell. It's more saying there is heaven at, or there is heaven and hell, but at the end of the times, it doesn't give a shit because it's just everlasting. All right, Stuart. Well, you're the happiest nihilist I've ever seen. Well, You've had a I, smile I, on your I, face I, this I think, entire I think, time. I think you have an obsession with like categorizing. No, no, no. no, no I've talked to, talk to many. Honesty. I've debated many yeah, nihilists yeah, on yeah, you. Intellectual yeah, honesty. campuses, trust me, no, they are usually very it's stoic. Really a social if you're going to be consistent, there's going to be no objective meaning. 
purpose to your life, significance to your life, objective. No, I would agree in terms of you can give your life meaning and significance, but everything points to the grave ultimately. So you can live to help people out, but you're still going to pass. No, Christianity, you're living for a God and for an immortal life where there will always be loving relationships. Tremendously difficult. That's the next question. That's the next question. Let's stay on nihilism because it rarely comes up here, and I love it. But but it's because it's rare because you because it's Nietzsche talks about nihilism a lot too, and he says if you're living. He's your, like, atheistic ne- prophet, right? No. When it comes to nihilism, Nietzsche, or, or yours, ne- perhaps. When Nietzsche, he talks about humanistic values you know and living to help Nietzsche. others you know and to love others and sacrifice Nietzsche. and to help the poor, he says, you're stealing from Christianity. You're calling yourself a nihilist, but you're not really one. And so that's why I love your consistency, but you shouldn't be happy. Like, a lot of, a lot of nihilists say you can either be happy and inconsistent or consistent and not happy I mean, because there's no ultimate meaning and purpose well, in life. That's what, that's what, you can also see it as a way, like, if, I, if I'm nihilistic... I don't, I don't give a f- like pretty much. That's I don't right. Care right. So it's like, but it's like at the same time, it's like YOLO. Like, right, right. Like you live your life like how it is. I mean, at the end of the times, you argue like this conversation. No matter if I prove your, if I prove my point to you guys, if you prove your point to me, at the end of the doesn't time, matter. We're, we're dead. Okay. It doesn't, it doesn't exactly. Matter. So if that's, time, if that's true, yeah. yeah. If we all just die and then we become fertilizer. Not, then not, don't act like there's some purpose to life. I'm you not, can create your own purpose, yeah. but have the honesty to acknowledge that the purpose that you create today, if you create the opposite purpose tomorrow, that's just as legitimate. Because there's no ultimate purpose, you just create your own purpose. So if my purpose today is to love him, but tomorrow my purpose is to hate him, there's nothing inconsistent about that, because I create my purpose. But that wouldn't be purpose, though. That would be like the way that you guide yourself in your life and your attitudes towards interacting with other human beings. So I can choose purpose my own purpose, purpose and define it any way yeah, I want okay, to. Yeah, okay, but we were talking about values, though. Like, no, we weren't. We were talking about nihilism and purpose. Now, if you want to talk yeah. about values, we'll talk well, about values. We got to the conversation from the value system. No, we didn't. We, he raised nihilism, nihilism, and okay. that's why we're talking about nihilism. We were, now, what we do you want to raise? I, I'm just... I, I just... The logical, the logical, like reasoning that you have behind your arguments are, are so. You haven't even listened. So, shaky. so come on, I, I get am real. Listening. No, I, you're not. You're not even listening. Yourself. I am listening very clearly to myself and to him and to him. You jump you're in not. and you go all over the place and it doesn't make any sense. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Do you think that Christianity should be a basis for morality? If you're an atheist and there is no God, then morality is relative. If you're a theist, be you a Muslim, a Christian, a Jew then you have an objective basis for objective morality. So I have no debate with my Jewish and Muslim friends when it comes to moral absolutes. Because they understand God exists, and therefore because God exists, and because God has chosen to give human life value, good and evil are real. They're real values. So my debate with an atheist and an agnostic is, there's no basis for moral absolutes. It's all a crapshoot. But my debate with a Muslim and a Jew is not that at all. We agree. Stuart, what do you think? Well, it's not Christianity that you base your morality on. It's a moral transcendent value of right and wrong. So if you want moral obligation and duties which say it's not your culture, it's not your evolutionary feelings that tell you this is right or wrong, because from that you can say, oh, I emotionally feel this is right or wrong, but there's no ought, there's no should. You should not have done that. You should have not lit that kitten's tail on fire. Yes, ma'am. To believe everything like you're saying to us, like you have to have some faith. So like, why do Christians say just have faith? Like what even is faith? Good, Stuart, go. Out of the book of Acts, even with doubting Thomas, there's always attached to faith, believe in me, based off of listen to eyewitness testimony that the resurrection actually occurred. Then further in Acts, it's based off of trust. Pistis, faith, is connected to trust, having a trusting relationship with Christ. So it's not just blind belief, mental assent to some type of philosophical principle. It's actually through the Gospels you can know a human being who was also God and build a trusting relationship through getting to know him through Scripture as well as prayer and an intimate relationship that way. Faith is real simple. Two days ago, he stepped onto a hunk of metal and trusted that hunk of metal to fly him from JFK down to Austin, Texas. Could he prove that that hunk of metal was reliable? Could he prove that that hunk of metal would get him safely through the sky to Austin, Texas? Absolutely no. In fact, his airplane sat on the tarmac for three hours. 
lots of problems mechanically. But eventually, that plane got off the ground and flew him safely to Austin, Texas. Evidence was Boeing, made by Boeing. Evidence was reliable mechanics put that hunk of metal together. But that evidence did him no good until he took a step of commitment, committing his life to that hunk of metal. That's what good faith is. Evidence of reliability plus commitment. The evidence is Jesus lived a sinless life, taught amazing teachings, died on a cross, loving his enemies, which I wouldn't have done, I'd have hated them, and then he rose from the dead. I can promise you, ma'am, if you die and rise from the dead, I will listen very carefully to everything you have to say. It's a solid piece of evidence that you are trustworthy. So faith in Christ involves evidence, not proof, evidence, plus commitment. You got to do it every day. And obviously, you guys have incredible trust in Texas State University. You can't prove to me that on your day of graduation, Texas State is not going to say, hey, guess what, guys? No diplomas this year. We're going to break tradition. You got me there. It could happen. It's possible. But the overwhelming evidence is Texas State University does not treat people that way. And that's why you're giving as much money and work to get a diploma from this fine university. That's faith. Let's be real honest. That is faith. And every time you go to a drugstore, and take a bottle of medicine from a pharmacist, and without chemically analyzing it, you go home and pop the pill. Let's be real honest, that is faith. Now, there's evidence that a pharmacist is reliable and the state of Texas has its laws, but you can't prove that that pharmacist has not been putting cyanide into that bottle. So, we all have faith. The question is, what is the object of your faith, and what is the evidence that the object of your faith is reliable? Stuart? So it's not blind belief. Because if you think it's blind belief, I mean, air travel is the safest form of travel. Safest form, and yet, we, so we do it all the time. An atheist, any atheist or agnostic, is going to step out here and use faith and belief. Now, they get very triggered emotionally when typically Christians say that to them, but it's absolutely one of the strongest facts out there. You cannot prove human rights. We take a, take a big step of faith to pursue human rights, especially if there is no God, as to why to, to find somebody's life tremendously valuable who lives across the entire globe to go and sacrifice for them. There's no evolutionary advantage for me to do that, and yet we live for human rights in a way where in the West we are considered much more tied to social justice than ever before. And so an atheist has to explain, if there is no God, if there is no Jesus Christ, why do that from something like a naturalist point of view? Yes, sir. Uh, but uh, how do you feel about the people like, uh, who use... Christianity to their advantage. Good question. For example, the Crusades that happened, or like uh, Spaniards coming over, uh, converting uh, natives. Yep. Good uh, question. They just used it to their advantage. How do you explain that? How do you explain that? Are those bad people, or are they doing it for the good of their faith? You explain it very simply by pointing out that Jesus' analysis of the human heart is spot on. We are liars, we are deceivers, we are manipulators, and hypocrisy is lying about who I am. If I stand out here and say I'm a follower of Christ, and after finish, I finish speaking, you watch me go out and womanize, there's a word you would use to describe me. What is that word? Hypocrite. Hypocrite. Thank you very much, ma'am. What is hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is pretending to be someone that I am not. That's hypocrisy. And if you read the Gospels, you'll notice that Jesus reserved his most scathing words for the religious hypocrites of his day. In Matthew chapter 23, six times, Jesus calls the Pharisees hypocrites. You hypocrites. What does he do in John chapter 2? He makes a whip of cords and he physically drives the money changers out of the temple. Why? Not because money is evil, but because those money changers were using, preying upon pilgrims' desire to worship God in the temple and they were excessively charging them in changing the currency from their foreign country to the Israelite currency. They were ripping people off. They were using people's desire to know God to make a haul of cash. And Christ was irate, and he kicked them out of the temple. So, 
don't give the hypocrites that you are exposed to the power to turn you off to the true Jesus who did not have a hypocritical bone in his body. The reason why the majority of you don't go to church is because of hypocrisy that you see. If there was not hypocrisy that you see in the Bible where Jesus is chasing after the Pharisees every single day saying that you are whitewashed tombs, I would have a tough time actually believing in the central claim of Jesus Christ because hypocrisy is everywhere. And I see hypocrisy today in our interactions with Christians and other people of different world views. We're talking about this with nihilism as well. And so that we see Jesus attacking hypocrisy over and over again, that makes sense in our world today when dealing with Christians who are hypocrites. We have to be very careful every single day, every Christian does, not to be a hypocrite. We talked about Jordan Peterson yesterday and how he said, I will not be a Christian because I don't think I could live out that ethic, that level, that type of standard. Okay, well, that's, that gets into the question of grace, though. What is grace? So we don't live to work our way up to God in any kind of way. And yet the question is, how consistent are we going to be? But I would certainly hope that none of you would fail to go to the church just because there are hypocritical Christians in that church or hypocritical Christians that you encounter here on this campus. Somebody else have an issue they want to raise? Yes, sir. Hey, I love y'all's, uh, y'all's intellect. I'm really appreciating it. Um, I guess my question is, is more about like the Christian mythology of the, the creation um, of angel, of angelic beings, of anything really. I, I just sit with the thought of this creative force manifesting itself from itself, outside of itself. And I, I'm using gestures and whatever. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how that comes into play. You're doing great. Keep going. Good. Yeah. So this creative force manifests itself um, I kind of think of it in a, in a mirror sense where these aspects of itself are then represented in these creative entities. So these creative entities in its dwelling, in its space, are imbued with divine nature that solely comes from the creator itself. These beings have the capacity to understand ego and hierarchy. And then you have this one... You have this lesion or whatever. You, you have this group of these creations that believe themselves to be of the equal stature of God. They are, in, in my mind, what they're doing is they're feeling the desire of wanting to be worshipped and recognized in the same way that their creator does in this story. And yet when they experience that force that has been imbued into them by the Creator, the Creator then condemns them away instead of dealing with this thing that has arisen that is a reflection of what it is and what it has put outside of itself. It's as if the Creator cannot deal with itself and banishes it and then allows it to seep into this planet and give us sin and all this other drama. I'm curious, I'm curious what y'all think about the, and I'm going to be judgmental, the Creator's incapacity to deal with itself. I'm curious what y'all think about that. I think the clearest answer is the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is the clearest statement that God is very interested in dealing with the problem of sin that you just very accurately described as being me de-godding God and me playing God. And that is sin. And instead of just wiping us out, God becomes a human being in Jesus Christ, bleeds and dies on a cross to provide the ultimate solution for the sin problem, to reconcile us to himself and to give us eternal life. What do you think, Stuart? So this is the problem I have with Allah or strictly monotheistic religions where it's just one being existing throughout time. So talk about ego. He can only love him or herself. But the Christian faith is tripartite, so community, a communal love, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Then you have the angelic realm, where angels are imbued with this spirit, loving each other as well. You have a fallen angel, you talked about ego, that Satan who decided, I'm not going to have this relationship, I'm going to live for self, and he falls. Then we were created in the third type of realm, if you want to call it, and we were given free will to choose whether to love God or to love ourselves and live for ourselves. We ultimately fell in that kind of way. Then 
entropy, messed up free will nature took place. But we all clearly have been imbued, which is why I love your language, with a soul, with an image that's created by God it's in us instead of simply beasts where we, if you take the naturalistic worldview, it's just the strong eat the weak and it's survival of the fittest. I, I feel like my, my question's not getting answered. Sorry, it's, what is your yeah. question? My, my question is, is pre-Jesus and all of that. I'm talking about the, the concept that this creative entity, the, these, okay, so the angels have nothing that comes from outside of God. There's not, the angel is a pure manifestation of God's creative force. There's nothing in this angel from anywhere else. Yet, they have the capacity to sin and have an ego sense above. God gave them the ability. Thank you. And God gave them the ability. God gave them that ability. Right. And when it manifests, instead of being like a forgiving archetype, an all-loving, all-knowing, all-accepting archetype, God, it, it removes that force away from itself and then allows it to manifest in other parts of its creation rather than just nipping it in the bud. All of this drama of needing to make a Jesus to come and absolve sin just seems like this f***ing roundabout way of saying, hey, Lucifer, you're here right now. Let's just hash this out. I'm God. Here you go. Blah. It's done. But instead... It's like God loves the drama or something. Okay, no, God does not love the drama. You but don't God think God loves, loves you. the drama. Correct. God does love you in spite of your rebellion against God. God loves me in spite of my rebellion against him. And he wants to get involved in the complexity of free, autonomous relationships. And that's why Jesus Christ came, to show his love for us. And then we can freely choose to come back to him, or we can choose to not come back to him. And I think that God can snap his fingers and say, you, a free individual, are going to love me. No, that's a violation of love. That's a violation of free will. God does not flick his fingers and say, you have to do this. You're, you're so right. And what we're doing is intellectualizing. And you're not going to force me to think a certain way. But you're going to present evidence that allows me to understand and rationalize this experience that we're having. Good. And that's all that I'm arguing God is capable of. I'm not arguing God snap his fingers and Good. brainwash Lucifer. I'm saying God can have the dopest conversation that ever existed. Yeah. And Lucifer would understand because Lucifer is not necessarily, in my opinion, my opinion, my naive, ignorant opinion, Lucifer is not turning away from God, but is turning so f***ing close to God that it thinks it is God. Well, then why don't you believe it's, in Jesus Christ? I didn't say that I don't. Okay, do you? I believe that Jesus lived. Yeah, but he, he claimed to be more than just a man. He claimed to be God in human form. Do you believe him? I, that's irrelevant no, to what I'm irrelevant. asking you right now. If he now. really is God, that's not the conversation. Entering you the keep complexity. bringing it back to Jesus, and I'm not trying to talk about Jesus right now. And I, I hope that makes sense. I'm and I hope not, it makes I'm, sense that I've taken your question seriously, I've answered you, and I've moved on to Jesus. You're right. Why? Okay. Because you talked about the I, complexity of relationship. On, if we're moving on, that's all I'm curious about. I'm not okay. curious about Jesus. Wait, can I just ask one question? Yeah, yeah. And maybe it has nothing to do with your question. Okay. <laughs> is this more so a question on why does God allow suffering? Because you're talking a lot about we just ended up in this in this place now. No, I'm just talking. I'm just talking about what seems like a, a major flaw in the Christian mythology. I'm not talking about why we have suffering. Uh, I don't care about that. It exists. I'm not trying to figure it out. I'm just trying to figure out like when you when when I analyze just the story itself, it just seems like such a silly flaw to me. Yes, sir. So, I have two questions. Yep. First take, of all, it, take it one at a time, because I can't remember much. Neither can I. It's a good one. Um, what denomination would you identify as? I am of no denomination. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, let's say I am a humble farmer somewhere in China, <laughs> and I've never heard about this so-called Jesus Christ. But I, I live my life in a way that people would consider to be a good Christian, Yes. I don't know anything about that. Right. Would I still have a place in heaven, or would I go to hell because I'm a non-believer? Good question. If you've never heard about Jesus, but you live a lifestyle that is very similar to what Christ taught, the evidence is you have a conscience given you by Almighty God, and you are choosing to exercise that conscience in a very responsible way. 
Second point, because you exercise your conscience in a very responsible way, you experience guilt at times when you do what you know is wrong to do, like me. Therefore, you get to the point where you realize, I need God's help. Just the way Stuart said, just the way Joshua said, I need God's help. Whoever God is, I need his help. And there are going to be a lot of people in heaven who live before Christ that the Bible talks about are going to be in heaven because they did exactly what I just told you. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Rahab a Gentile prostitute. They all struggled to live good lives. They realized, oh gosh, I blew it. They experienced guilt and they threw themselves upon God saying, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm trusting you. And so there are going to be a lot of people in heaven who never heard the word Jesus, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Rahab, a Gentile prostitute listed in Hebrews chapter 11, who to the best of their ability responded to all the light that God gave them, trusting in God, throwing themselves upon God, they are responsible. Now, all of us here have the opportunity to do work. None of you are stupid right here. None of you are ignorant right here. And you have more than ample opportunity, each one of you, to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's about 140 pages. And you've got to ask yourself, does the evidence point to Christ being reliable or does it not? And after you, if after you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you conclude the evidence is Christ was a hypocrite, he was a jerk, then you better reject him. But if the evidence is the sanity of Christ, the goodness of Christ, the love of Christ, the power of Christ to die and rise from the dead is so overwhelming, then you better put your faith in him. Stuart, what do you think? Well, it's interesting you said China because China is going to have the highest percentage of Christians out of any other country very soon. It's going to have 100 million Christians, according to one sociologist, more than one, Rodney Stark. And just to add to that, going, remember this, going back to the idea of this person's better than that person, that's very Hindu. It's very Muslim in different ways. And there's even, it's very Buddhist in some ways, very Jewish in others. So all other religions. But the cross and the grace of Christ is all about, I can't do it on my own. It doesn't matter how much I help UNICEF. It doesn't matter how much I help those who are sex trafficked. I cannot do it on my own. I need Jesus Christ to save me. I'd like to invite you to Grace Community Church located at 365 Lukeswood Road in New Canaan, Connecticut. Our services are at 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. on Sundays. Hope you can join us.